Good afternoon, everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about market updates and a Q4 update for 2023, everybody. My name is Jake Wire. I'm Troy Williamson with Cornerstone Home Lending. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Hey guys, this is Jake Wire. And like I said, we're gonna talk about a Q4 market update. All everybody wants to know what's going on with the interest rate. And I have Troy Williamson with Cornerstone here. He literally was just on his phone checking the market update, which he's done about <laughs> 10 times since I've been talking to him. So he absolutely has his finger on the pulse much more than I do. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about what's going on in the Q4? Sure. Uh, I don't think it's any secret to anybody that over the course, I mean, really over the last few months, but especially over the last, you know, couple of months, uh, specifically the last few weeks, we've seen a pretty significant uh, increase in mortgage rates. Uh, you know, media is picking up you know, headlines. I mean, it, you know, people are talking about it. Everybody knows about it. Um, you know, it, it's particularly worrisome for people that are, you know, building or buying new construction homes that may not be ready for several months out because they, you know, a lot of times we'll let their rates float. They won't lock them in up, in up front. And so obviously they're relying on their lender to keep a close eye on what the market's doing. Um, you know, I always say we, the variables that we watch, uh, you know, for kind of dictating or trying to figure out what the market's going to do moving forward, we're looking at inflation numbers. We're looking at employment reports. We're looking at, you know, all kinds of things, but primarily inflation and labor numbers, because that's what the Federal Reserve is looking at most strongly when they're trying to figure out what decisions they're going to make in regards to monetary policy moving forward. Primarily, you know, what they're going to do with the Fed funds rate. They're going to keep it higher. They're going to increase it. You know, are they going to start cutting it at some point in time, which they will. We don't know when that's going to be. But, you know, all these things that we watch uh, in the reports coming out, trying to figure out what the Federal Reserve is going to do, which ultimately impacts the market, which impacts interest rates. Then, you know, just when you think that you're watching all the variables involved that you know of, then you've got variables, you know, external factors that come out of nowhere. For instance, what's going on in the Middle East right now? Uh, you know, a lot of times when you've got tensions abroad, um, you know, war, you got still, you know, Russia and Ukraine going on. A lot of times, traditionally, mortgage rates will actually get better because investors will pull money out of the stock market, put it into the bond market because that's more of a safe haven investment, less volatile most of the time. Um, but we're not even seeing that. You know, I, I would, in a normal market, I would have anticipated that when the tension started with, you know, in, with Israel and in and, and Gaza, that we would have seen some, you know, minor improvement in interest rates, and uh, and we haven't seen that at all. Maybe some stability uh, to an extent, but you know, because I'm gonna all been craving some stability. Yeah, I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna use that word loosely because <laughs> uh, it, you know, but like Jake said, I mean, we've got a you know a website uh, or an app on my phone that we basically watch the bond market, mortgage-backed securities, because that's ultimately what's dictating. Uh, or giving us an idea of what the mortgage-backed security market is doing and what interest rates are doing throughout the course of the day. And if I had a dollar for every time that I hit refresh, I wouldn't have to work anymore. Um, but, you know, it's... Or every time I call you and ask you what the rates are. Currently. Right, yeah. exactly. Because it feels like that's a fluctuation hourly, if definitely daily it, right it, now. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time talking to our borrowers about the fact of, you know, when you're if you're shopping around between different mortgage lenders, you know, you get a quote from yesterday with one lender, you get a quote today from another lender. The one you got yesterday is is obsolete at this point in time. I mean, it, it could still be valid depending upon what the market's done, but with as volatile as what the market's been over the course of the last forever at this forever. point. That's what that's that's the issue, is that the volatility has been such a long yeah. period that I feel like people constantly are waiting for something to get better and something to get better, and then you watch the news and the next thing hits the fan. Absolutely. So uh, I, I think a little bit of what my I've been telling my clientele anyways is that if you have to buy a house and everybody has to live somewhere, yeah. you're either renting a house or you're buying a house, you're usually still better off buying the house because ultimately your money's going out the door if you're renting a house. It's You're, you're saving nothing. You're paying uh, off someone's rate. Absolutely. And I mean, it, you know, rent prices are, are high. I mean, we, we, we look at the shelter costs because that's a component of inflation reports. Um, shelter costs have been dropping a little bit, which is good because it's deflationary. And ultimately, the Federal Reserve is trying to bring inflation numbers down 
Um, that's what they're looking at along with the labor market, uh, you know, when trying to make those decisions moving forward about what they're going to do with the Fed funds rate. Um, that's the whole purpose of what the Federal Reserve has done with, you know, increasing the Fed funds rate is they're trying to slow down the economy. Uh, they've done a very good job of bringing inflation numbers down. I think at the peak, we were at like over 9%, just over 9%. I think that was last June. Um, and now I think the most recent inflation reports in the high three. So certainly some positive progress there. Now I know stuff, I mean, you look around, groceries are still expensive. Gas is fluctuating. You know, you'll have a period of time where, you know, it's it's lower than obviously you've got tensions in the Middle East. That could drive gas prices up. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the Federal Reserve now, they, they see inflation has made a meaningful drop lower. Um, and they feel like there's obviously still room. Uh, you know, they want to see inflation still come down. But what they're looking at even more strongly than inflation numbers right now, I feel like, is is labor numbers. Um, the, you know, it's, the labor market has been resilient. That, um, that's what it keeps coming out, right? It keeps yeah. expecting it not to be, and then it keeps showing strong numbers. Absolutely. Yeah, unemployment claims are still low. I mean, they are increasing, but they're lower than what the market's anticipating on a pretty frequent basis. Um, you know, job creation numbers, you, know, you have a month, I think last month was way above what the market expected. Um, wage growth is slowing. Um, and, and I think part of the reason we look, when you look at unemployment claims, uh, when they come out every Thursday for the week prior, you're looking at unemployment claims filed for the first time, which those have been the numbers that have been basically lower than what the market's anticipating, which means people are not filing for new unemployment claims at the pace at which the market was thinking. But it's still the same people refiling. You, so the other number that we look at uh, is a part of that component or component of that report is continuing claims, which are people that continue to file claims. And those have been increasing, which basically mean that when people are losing their jobs, they're having a hard time finding another job. Mm-hmm. And then also in the labor reports the, or the job creation reports, you know, it, it, it gives you an idea of how many jobs are created, but a lot of those jobs are part-time jobs. Right. Holiday stuff yep. and things like that. Right you now it peaks, obviously. Yep. Um, all the Walmarts and the Home Depots and everyone's hiring for all, everything in between. So. Absolutely. So, you know, there's all kind of seasonal components uh, mm-hmm. to those reports, which don't always get mentioned in the headlines. You know, the headlines come out and it's like, oh, you know, the job creation was twice as much as what the market was anticipating, but they don't go on to say that, hey, Christmas is coming up. Or, you know, summertime, you know, retail sales might be higher because people are going on vacation and things like that. There's all kinds of things that contribute. I mean, as a society, we consume data so quickly that it's all headline based. It is. And so a headline that grabs you for five seconds is worth way more than an actual meaningful article these days. Absolutely. Which I feel like a lot of our clientele now comes to us just for advice, I think, because they see these huge eye-catching headlines and they say, well, I I can't buy a house right now because of this or this because I saw this on whatever website or newspaper, I don't think they're looking at newspapers anymore, but whatever website they're looking at, and that, that that's the facts, and they want to d- kind of fact check that against what we know. And I think what I'm telling a lot of folks is that like you absolutely are gonna need to live somewhere. That's just kind of one of those staples. It's absolutely. not something you can push off forever. Um, you're either gonna rent or you're either gonna buy. And so a lot of the times what we're talking to our clientele about is strategies, mm-hmm. like can you afford this monthly? I get the rates ridiculous, and I hate that date the rate marry the price uh, you're gonna hear it from every single realtor out there yep. and it is to some extent true and it's cheesy and I, and I apologize for my entire industry for spouting that out for the last couple of years but in reality this rate's not going to be permanent you right. know it's really it's going to go up or down and if you lock in your rate that's your rate so if you're comfortable with that monthly we were just speaking about this if you're yeah. comfortable with your monthly that rate's locked in and if you want to refinance, you're not only going to refinance if it goes down. So it's only going to get better. So if you're comfortable, you're comfortable. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I, you know, just like we did talk about it's when you're, we don't spend a lot of time talking with our borrowers about rates so much because, I mean, honestly, it's kind of depressing. Yeah, um, it's bad. The rates are bad. Yeah. And we talk more about payment because at the end of the day, that's what's going to be important primarily to a borrower. It's like, where do you want your monthly payment to be? What are you comfortable paying? Right. You know, and if you say, hey, $2,800 a month, you know, we're going to factor in taxes, insurance, everything that's included. And we're going to say, okay, if you want your payment to be no more than $2,800 a month, this is the price range you need to be looking in. 
great. Okay, you know exactly what you need to do. So when that client calls you and says, I need to be looking in the $400,000 price range because that's where I know my payment's going to be, you know, fits right. in my comfort level, then great. You know, but that's the conversations that we're having more so than rate. Um, and there are some strategies for interest rates, you know, especially if you're, you know, buying a home and the seller is engaged and motivated. You know, there's temporary interest rate buy downs that you can look at where the seller basically buys your interest rate down by a couple percentage points for the first two years. That kind of helps to give you a transition period where the payment's not so high for the first year or two with the anticipation that you're going to refinance hopefully within that 24 month period before your rate goes to the, well, you know, the, the fully amortized rate. Right, right. So, you know, some things that we talk about, some strategies that we use and, and discuss to try to make buying a home, you know, a bit more achievable. Right. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, with the price increases that we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, because of the high demand and the limited amount of supply, you take that, you know, and compile that along with the rise in interest rates, you know, it, it makes affordable housing really, really challenging. Um, yeah. And it does, and it, and it stinks. Um, and, that, you know, I don't know, I don't think house prices are going to come down anytime soon. And it, the demand's still high, although it's waned a bit, but, you know, it'd take a long time for supply to catch up with demand. Well, I feel like that's a regional thing mm -hmm. also. Like here's specifically in Wilmington yeah. area, we are so behind on what our supply that and the demand is so high that I think it's going to be outstripping the, the housing stock for at least a few years yep. um, before we get caught up anywhere close to caught up. And so what we are talking to a lot of our clientele is, is strategies is we're trying to like, you know, me and you are both still actively, you know, deal, dealing in our own personal real estate. It's not slowing us necessarily down because we're under the assumption that, you know, at some point we'll be able to refinance this. This is probably, yep. you know, it's not a great rate, but if you have to do something, you have to do something. Right. And the other thing to realize is that in this market, unlike in the last three, four years, it's really the only market that there's been any ability to negotiate. True. Um, you know, as soon as we see those rates drop, I keep telling you, I'm not going to see you for like two years because you're going to be buried under loans because people are going to be refinancing. People are going to be buying like crazy. It's going to, there's going to be millions of buyers that have been sitting on the sideline right now. They're just yeah. going to flood the market. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when that time hits, you know, it, it's, it'll be, you know, it'll take us back, I think, to the 2020, 2021 period where everybody was refinancing. Yeah. You know, I don't think that we see, you know, barring any major economic situation or, you know, geopolitical situation, which nobody wants to deal with. We're not going to see rates in the twos and threes again. But honestly, that wasn't really healthy. You basically, that right. started back in, you know, the recession and the housing bubble back in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right. And they were trying to keep rates low to continue to stimulate the economy. You know, you roll through a recession and then you have a pandemic, you know, so what is not normal became normal. And it was that way. If you would have asked me back in 2012, if I would have thought the rates were still in the twos and threes in 2020, I would have told you we're nuts. Right. But that's where we were. Right. You know, so I, I don't think twos and threes are not really healthy. It was just, it was necessary at the time. And I think honestly, it probably should have started. There should have been actions taken prior to when the actions that were actually taken to increase, that. To increase the rate yep, gradually. Cause I don't think that we'd be necessarily sitting where we are today with rates in the sevens and eights. Well, that's part of it too, is the shock of mm -hmm. how quickly it came up. Yep. I mean, we du more than doubled in six, seven, eight months, yeah. which is not a normal thing. No. Um, so I think the shock of that <laughs> is starting to settle in a yeah. little bit for people, but I mean, it's taken six or seven months for that to settle in a little bit. This is the new reality. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that we're talking about for strategy wise is that consumer debt right now is kind of skyrocketing. Yep. Everything's more expensive. It's been more expensive for so long because of what's going on with the economy. Mm -hmm that people are racking up those credit cards. They aren't slowing down necessarily on the spending, or they haven't till recently anyways, and yeah. those credit card debts are going through the roof and not being paid off. Yeah. Um, and consumer debt is, is the interest rate would make an 8 9% interest rate. I mean, that would be lovely for Absolutely. consumer debt. We're talking more mid to high 20s. Yeah. Um, so what we're talking to people a little bit about is if you have a ton of equity in your house, which a lot, a lot of, of people do. A lot of people do right now. That's yeah. one thing they do have. If you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity in your house and you're sitting on that two and a half, three percent interest rate, sometimes you're better off even if you want to move up in the house or down in the house or to a different area, you might be better off selling that house, taking that equity, paying off some of that consumer debt and taking on that higher home interest rate 
and then you got what we call a blended rate that's a little bit lower than what you're dealing with right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it is hard and that's the leading to obviously the, the supply issue is people don't want to sell their homes because they have those 2.75% interest rates. I get it. You know, you don't want to sell your home. Yeah. You'll make a bunch of money. It's like, you're going to buy something that's more expensive then not only in price, but also your rate's going to be, you know, two to three times as much. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you're in a situation where you've got, you know, I mean, everything, interest rates are higher. You know, the Fed funds uh, rate, when that increases, it drives up credit card interest rates. It drives up car interest rates. You know, you can't get a car interest rate in the twos anymore. Now you're looking at, even for great credit, in sevens and eights. Um, so everything's more expensive because of the increase in the Fed funds rate. So when you start, you know, credit cards, 20, even for good credit borrow, like consumer credit cards for like Kohl's, Home Depot, I mean, those are 24, 25, 26, 30%. Yeah. Um, regardless of how good your credit is. Yeah. So and if you're not playing paying that off monthly, right. you're never going to see the end of that. No, exactly right. And I think when you, we, you know, and yes, the consumer continues to be resilient and spend, but they're spending, they've, they've gone through their savings. Yeah. You know, if you, they, in the government tracks savings rates and all the money that the consumer had from COVID savings and stimulus, it's pretty much been almost burned through at this point in time. Um, I think I saw a report the other day. I mean, if it hasn't been burned through yet, I think by the end of the year, certainly, you know, most of that savings is going to be gone. Um, student loan payments are getting ready to go into effect. In, you know, interest rates on credit cards are higher, which drives the payments up. The consumer is, yes, they're continuing to spend, but they burn through their savings and they're borrowing that money. So at some point in time, between student loans going back into effect as payments and also credit card pay, you know, payments on the money that they're borrowing to buy stuff, it, it's not sustainable. So things are going to have to you know, slow down. I think we're going to see that in the coming months. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I hope it's not significant, but you're starting to see delinquencies on cars increase. You know, car payments from, I think the amount of people that have a car payment over $1,000 a month right now is like the highest that it's been. That and, doesn't surprise me. Yeah. But, you know, again, I mean, I think the car industry was kind of crazy too over the last several years because of supply and demand. Right. Um, between that and interest rates going up, it's just, you know, it's, it's driven those payments up quite a bit. So... So, I mean, I guess what a lot of it comes down to is if you have to make a move, yep. I wouldn't necessarily let the fact that these interest rates are ridiculous right. stop you from making a move yep. and come under the assumption that it's probably going to get better. And the good thing is if you lock in a 30 year fixed, it's not going to get worse for you. True. You, you're where you're at. So it comes back to feeling comfortable with your monthlies. Um, but if you are feeling like you're drowning in consumer debt and credit card debt and things like that, and you're sitting on, you know, $100,000, $200,000 of equity, there's some things to be talked about with that too. It's worth sitting down with someone like Troy and running those numbers because you can quickly find out with someone like with your brain, with yeah. your numbers more than me, that you can figure out if you're going to be saving money monthly. Absolutely. And if you're saving money monthly, it really is kind of a moot point. You make that move, you take that higher interest rate on the house and you pay off all those, all that consumer debt. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, and two, there's options too for you know equity loans. With all the equity that people do have in their homes, you leave your first lien alone. You can get a, a secondary lien on the property to borrow money to to tie up or wrap up some consumer debt to save money as well. So there's a couple different options there. Again, it's all strategy. It's and Troy, just tell me about options. that. You guys just you just started that product, right? We, yeah, we do. We have a, a product that um, you know in the past I've, I've referred out equity loans and equity lines of credit to local banks. But we do have a product that we just rolled out. Um, it's a fixed rate secondary lien on the property. You can amortize it over 15, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are a little bit higher. But if you're paying off, when I say a little bit higher, you know, between potentially 10 and 12%, a lot of variables involved there are credit, loan to value. But if you're paying off debt that's at 25 to 30%, I mean, it's a savings. And it's, you know, you're going to ultimately pay principal and interest. You're going to make big dents or, or, you know, achieve. Um, some positive headway in paying off those debts where if you're trying to pay off credit card debt at 30% interest and making your minimum monthly payment, you're barely touching. You're not touching the principal at all. You're just basically paying interest mostly. And it lets you tap into that that locked in equity that you have in those houses. Right. Um, and there is an unprecedented amount of equity right now yep. for the American homeowner. So um, reach out to us. I, I hate that, like I said, that, that date the rate thing, but 
Um, I want to tell people not to be scared of these rates necessarily. If you need to make a move, you need to make a move. Um, and there are strategies to be had. I w stay out of the headlines yeah. best you can. Yep. Call a local professional, reach out to myself, reach out to Troy. We can absolutely talk to you about options. You know, if you're best not doing something, we'll tell you that too. Absolutely. Um, that's the one good thing about both of us. We're, we're definitely gonna shoot you straight, put you in the best position possible. But if you are looking to make a move, you know, how many years can you possibly wait for something to get better? Sure. Um, I feel like when I keep turning around, I, I, there's something new hitting the news. And so I kind of stay out of the headlines best I can. Yeah. Um, stay in my lane, I guess, is the best yeah. way I say it. Well, we have an election next year, so I mean, that's that's a whole another variable to consider too, with the you know, with the market. So reach out to us. Let us know if you have questions. Um, we're in Q4 right now, 2023. Uh, there's a bunch of new stuff, uh, information that's coming out as far as reports go, and things that might be changing in the next week or yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, this week is full of economic reports. So things might be looking better or worse. Yeah. Hard to say which way that's going to go. Um, so um, we appreciate you stopping in. Like I said, reach out to myself, Troy. Um, we'll have our information here below on the video, and we'd be happy to walk you through any of this. Thank you so much for stopping in. Have a good day.